This week we're joined by Richie, our uh, draft analysis guy, and we want to just kind of pick your brain a little bit about some of the upcoming prospects in the 2024 NFL draft. You know, the Bears are coming into this draft with four draft picks, right? The top need is the quarterback. So quarterback is going to be need one. That leaves you with three more draft picks. That's why a lot of people throw out the scenario of trading backs, trying to acquire more draft capital and things like that. Say, however, that does not happen. Say you are stuck with the three picks that you have. What are the three positional needs you think the Bears are going to target? But at the very top of the draft in the first round, there are premium positions. And normally that's O-line. You see a lot of offensive tackles go in the first round. Offensive tackle and edge, premium positions in the draft, and the Bears just happen to need them. Wide receiver, uh, a little bit more help is good. Um, Everything else, you know, they could draft any other position, but it would just be depth pieces at that point. And you could say the same thing about wide receiver, but Keenan Allen's getting up there in age, and uh, we don't have him to a long-term contract yet, so it'd be good to draft a wide receiver just in in that case anyways. I always take it in two thoughts, right? It's positional need of what the team needs, right? Uh, what's available in the draft and like best player available. And I always tend to lean towards like draft best player available overall as a general rule. Um, Obviously team needs necessitate what they do. So like you said, like quarterbacks off the list, like Caleb Williams is the first pick. You may as well talk about having three picks. There's no point in saying you have four picks bears needs wise and how I think the narrative has been pushed. I'm going to switch it up a little bit. My first choice is going to be defensive end by a lot. My team needs, that I think the Bears will need is going to go defensive end. Really, I think, under talked about is defensive tackle and then potentially wide receiver slash offensive tackle. However, with what's available in the media and what we've read in the last few days, I think clearly the team is talking offensive tackle, defensive end, wide receiver. What I think about it, I tend to agree with the interior defensive line idea i think we need another defensive tackle here just because of how thin we are at that position really you do have you know javon dexter you got andrew billings justin jones went got 30 million dollars somewhere else i mean you got you're you're gonna need another guy there also on the opposite side of the ball on the interior of the line i think garden center is a huge need i think uh i i know like you said it might be depth but we only have a center here for a year I would not mind targeting a center in this draft. And then, yeah, like you guys are saying, wide receiver. However, it is wide receiver three. It's also, you know, there's also room to grow at that position in the future. Like Richie said, Keenan Allen's not here long-term or anything like that. However, when we start looking at it, once we you have those needs, it's like, okay, a lot of people are throwing out there the idea that you take a wide receiver at number nine. It's your third wide receiver, and it's going to be the second or third wide receiver that it's going to be available to you, whereas you may have the pick of the litter at multiple different positions. Bears get to pick nine. Ideally me, personally, I want to trade back. I want to trade back. I want to get draft draft capital. But what guys would have to be at that position for you to be happy with the Bears pulling a trigger and just saying, hey, we're going to take this guy? Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. Ideally, we trade back, but let's just say that's impossible for some reason. Or like the Jets follow us. Why trade up to us if you need a quarterback? You can trade with the Jets. So there, there, there's different scenarios and things like that that may make it so, you know, we don't find a trade partner to drop back. Jared Verse, uh, strong as hell. He can play the run just as well as he plays the pass. I think nine sacks a year is especially opposite of Montez Sweat. He can learn from Montez Sweat a little bit um, as he's playing, as he's learning. That is the most tantalizing to me. Dallas Turner is an unmissable, unskippable pick. You cannot pass that if he's still there at nine, because I think you're talking about two to three teams that could use him, but don't take him for some reason. He's really raw, but I think in the situation the Bears are at, I think you get the advantage of getting a raw physical specimen at defensive end. If you get a quarterback and defensive end, and you got the first choice of both positions at one and nine, you can't skip on that. And even if your first guy is Jared Verse, who he did visit with the Bears, I like Jared Verse a lot. Either one of those guys, I think you kind of can't skip on those. However, in my mind, I think the Roma Dunze's Joe Alts, if they're still there and some team is just in love and they're willing to give you, you know, a second and a third, and then you just slide back like 10 spots, I think that's like an unmissable, unskippable type of trade scenario on the other side. And then you get 
you know, Tavondre Sweat at 14, 15, 16. I mean, you get defensive tackle or something like that. So unskippable, I would say, is defensive end. I don't think Joe Alt and Roma Dunze being there necessitate or facilitate like I can't I can't skip this guy. I can't trade back. You might want to you might want to leverage their media popularity and their kind of hype lately and turn that into a, a good haul. In terms of positional value, and we had this conversation with Jacob Infante about positional value. I love that conversation and like positional need and all that good stuff. In my mind, I played it out, right? And Paulie, you said this, like you're drafting for a wide receiver three, right? Yes, granted, DJ Moore, Keenan Allen might get hurt. Roman Dunze turns into wide receiver two for a good chunk of the season. That's all hypothetical. And let's say it's a perfect world, right? Let's say you play out this offseason and you come out of this draft with Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze. And now training camp's coming up and we're talking about, can we get Yannick Ngakwe back for a cheaper contract, right? Can we address the defensive end position and yada, yada, yada? How do we add depth to defensive tackle? This, that, and the other. And I feel like that route, while it's fun because it's offense, there's a lot of question marks. It's a rookie quarterback with a rookie wide receiver and two veteran wide receivers. And yeah, like you can only spread the ball around so much. So let's say in a perfect world, you have Roma Dunze with Caleb Williams and he's playing great. Roma Dunze is getting you 700 yards maybe and like five to five to seven touchdowns. Can I intervene yeah. real quick? Yeah. Listen, I'm so far on one end of this whole thing where mm -hmm. if Marvin Harrison Jr. falls to nine, I, I would be I would be so happy because it guarantees me a trade partner. Yeah. Same. That that that's how I feel about the wide receiver position. And I know me Richie, you were laughing at probably the idea. I would pass him up. The other part so, of this is if Caleb Williams is everything you hope he is, we're talking about like you want to compare to Aaron Rodgers. This is a guy that made Randall Cobb like a pro bowler. So Julian Edelman was on his podcast talking about uh, how Tom Brady, you know, he, he would invite him to workouts. And on a normal day with wide receiver training in the summer, you know, they ask you to run routes, route trees, fix each other's like body positioning and stuff like that. Quarterback invites you. They ask you to run 25, 30 routes, right? Like that's a heavy, heavy work day, right? You're running 25 hard full speed routes. Julian Edelman mentioned that. I think he said he, Tom Brady had him run 75 to 90 routes, right? And the whole time Tom Brady is saying, look, when I throw the ball, I expect you to put all your weight on the inside foot leverage, peel back and hit the sideline. And Julian Edelman just constantly kept talking about how Tom Brady, a quarterback, was probably the person that made him better at wide receiver than his wide receivers coach, his head coach, his coaches all the way through, right? When a quarterback can dictate what they want you to do, you become more successful. And that's why I was never in the favor of the Justin Fields narrative. Like he just needs three number one wide receivers and he's going to be a stud. Like what? that's a problem. Where was Julian Edelman drafted? What round? Seventh round. Seventh round pick 11. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. That That's why positional value. That That's exactly it. You're spending your 1-1 one, one at quarterback. Ideally, the risk has already been taken. You don't need to pad that room with guys to make Caleb Williams that much better. You already gave him DJ Moore and Keenan Allen. You're talking about a, you're playing the hypothetical offseason game. You come out of the draft with Roma Dunze and Caleb Williams, and you're just fingers crossed that everybody's gelling, has chemistry, and now you're hoping that you can fill some positions of need on defense, right? So you're saying Caleb, Roma Dunze in a perfect world with everybody healthy and Caleb Williams being a 4,000-yard passer – Romo Dunze is coming out of the season with maybe 700 yards and five touchdowns, and he's probably in the rookie of the year competition. Flip that over, and now you have Caleb Williams. Now you take Jared Verse, right? In an ideal scenario, Jared Verse on this defense, and part of this is also I don't think defense is the most inconsistent part of football. You can have a top five defense one year and a 15th ranked defense the next year and nothing changed, right? So you can't rest on your laurels because the last six, seven games of the year, you were a top five defense. You still have to improve defense because that stuff is always changing. Somebody gets a step slower. Somebody messes up their gapping position. Somebody's coach that they liked and was the secret sauce just left. And so now you got Jared Verse. A good year for Jared Verse opposite – a good, like, a Jervon Dexter year that's up, uh, a Montez Sweat year. Jared Verse should end with, like, nine sacks, ten sacks, 11 sacks, yeah. right? 
So I'd rather have Caleb Williams, 11 sacks from Jared Verse, and go get Tyler Boyd or Hunter Renfro in training camp. Or wait for a training camp wide receiver cut. Somebody's getting cut in, in training camp this year that you don't expect. Somebody's going to be a cap casualty that you still don't expect. We just got Stefan Diggs traded for a second, essentially second or mid third round pick 21 days before the draft. You don't see defensive ends getting traded today. You, know, you mentioned Chop Robinson to me. Chop Robinson, interesting prospect, fun prospect. He, he's going to be fun to watch for a few years. His arms aren't the longest for being uh, as tall as he is. He's six foot three, close to six foot four. His arms end up being like 32 inches. Um, not the length that you want out of a defensive end, but he uses his tools extremely well, including his arms. Basically, he plays the offensive lineman to wherever their possession is, and he goes against them and gets around them. That's his whole game. How does he get around them? And he uses... 32 and a half inch arms extremely well for that because if they have his hands on his pad he swipes and just gets around him it's something that you see consistently and i saw a lot of penalties that should have been on the offensive lineman when they were lined up against him that happens in the nfl sometimes hopefully he goes to a prestigious team so that he gets the calls that he needs it's good that he's faster than he is strong because if a guy just wins with barely enough strength that tends to not work so well in the nfl because the guys are bigger and stronger he always has a really good first step and a strong first step so it's not just fast he has when i say he's faster than he is strong he still has requisite play strength that you want out of a defensive end he's projected to go somewhere in the second round he's not going to be necessary to take with the number nine overall pick. He's not like a can't miss prospect. Um, he's not, that's the reason he's not in the first round. Ball just the tiniest bit underthrown, but look at the separation by six foot seven, 240 pound Johnny Wilson. I just put a little highlight video together and I threw it out there. And uh, you know, some of the comments I've got were mostly around the fact that he had a lot of drops. Johnny Wilson has a few drops. He can improve upon that, obviously. Another dude who had drops, I'm not saying he's going to be the same talent or the same skill set, but another dude who had drops was Ter Terrell Owens. Johnny Wilson, when you have someone of that size who's able to move that fast, and he plays the wide receiver position like a wide receiver. He doesn't play like a klutz. His route running still has some polish on it. He decided to up and run a 4-5-7, I think, at the combine. That is insane to do as a six foot six, almost six foot seven. Man, in our text messages back and forth recently, we were talking about Jerron Dexter. One thing you said to me is, He's six six, you can't teach that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, you can't teach being six seven, right? Brandon Marshall was only six four. The thing is, Johnny Wilson can play like Brandon Marshall. Uh, it just boggles my mind the, the ceiling on the guy. He's a, a friend for every quarterback, uh, security blanket. Um, he's also an extremely willing pass blocker or run blocker, just whoever he's blocking. He's like this little pipsqueak defender on me. They tend to be like five eleven. you know, he can murder them. What round is Johnny Wilson projected to go in? He's projected to go early in the third. Those projections, they're loose. Who knows what, where he goes? He could go more in the second. He can go slip into the fourth. Um, Weak side linebacker is what Eberflus stated is necessary in his system for his defense to work. Jeremiah Trotter is kind of custom built to be a weak side linebacker, though. He has the requisite uh, play strength at linebacker, but he's able to get all over the field. He has very good speed, very good quickness. What more can you ask of a linebacker? I say if he's there later in the third, he's a steal. Uh, you put together that highlight tape. He's fun to watch, is he not? When I do the highlight videos, I try and keep them around two minutes long. Mm -hmm. Um, his, I could have doubled the time easily. Like, yeah, there was a lot of plays to pick from a lot of, a lot of cool game changing plays. It seems like he was a part of, so definitely a solid player. It looked like to me, where's he projected to go later in the third or early in the fourth, uh, a speed running back or a wide receiver. Sometimes he gets chipped a little bit and they just get past him. So that's, it's a team game. Anyways, he can't make every single play himself. Also his play strength. Uh, he weighs 231, six foot two. And he, he looks like it. Sometimes he doesn't go nose first into the ball because there's two guys making the tackle already. And you know, sometimes you want a glass eater mentality, someone that's still going to get in there and go for the ball or whatever. Sometimes he's like making a business decision. Like I don't need three guys landing on me right now. And if he just doesn't take on blockers uh, fearlessly, okay, he does what he has to, to shed blockers. So that's, and that's what you expect out of a later third round guy.
okay, so he doesn't have elite physical traits. He's still a really good football player. Where's he projected to go, and what do you think about Cedric Van Brand? Maybe somewhere in the third. Um, there's a couple centers ranked ahead of him, and it's understandable because he's not the can't miss prospect. The hopeful scenario in our head is that the Bears trade back from nine, and then they make another trade back, and then they have a slew of picks in that second, third, fourth round range. And plus, again, position of need. It, it's hard to spend a first round pick on a center, or, or not position of need, position, uh, positional value. That's what I meant to say. Cedric Van Pran, he's going to be a starting center in the NFL for a long time. He doesn't have uh, injury history. He's toolsy, but he's a very good football player. The the only knock on him is that he doesn't have elite guard stuffing strength. He does all the pre-snap reads extremely well. Just, you know, sitting in Chicago for so long, I was so tired of seeing shotgun snaps just go up here on the QB or bounce off the ground or fumbled on a normal snap. I just want a guy who's just played center his whole career, and that's something Cedric Van Pran has done. He is a center who knows all the pre-snap reads. He's a smart player. He knows uh, how to run the zone system really well. He knows how to leave his block for another person, pick up the second block. He knows how to go to the second level. Let's just get him and solve this issue. I'm a fan of his as well. Uh, Georgia, championship pedigree, knows how to win. Really, really good, like, two, three-year starter. If you're in love with a guy in the third round right now, I mean, I don't – you have 10 draft picks as of now in the 2025 draft. So if we're talking about, you know, if Ian Cunningham leaves, if another player leaves and you get a two more third round compensatory picks, I wouldn't think it's absurd to, you know, here's a third and a sixth. Let me get your, you know, late second, early third for this year. And you go pick up a guy like Cedric Van Pran. I mentioned that recently. I know we've talked about that possibility. And I mentioned that recently in a chat when I was watching Robert Schmitz. And somebody was like, why would you trade up? And I was like, well, listen, it's something nobody's talking about right now. Like, but it is a possibility. If you do like a guy, if you really like a guy and he's available later than you thought he is, you do have draft capital next year. We're talking like, hey, I'll give you a second rounder next year, one of my two, to go up and, you know, go up into the third or something because Cedric Van Pran fell. You're talking about a positional value. Like, yes, positional value is all well and good. We agree with it a lot, but. You're talking about three young core players that you can address that are staples in your offense, right? And something that would be refreshing. Um, we're so sick of the center value, center position. You got two stopgap centers in there this year. Ryan Bates is a stopgap center. I I can't uh, can't agree with anybody who tells me that he's like an elite starting center. He's not. These are all stopgap things. If you want to address a, a, an important position for the next three to five years, like. Center, defensive end, and quarterback are not wasted draft picks, even if they don't become like pro bowlers and hall of famers. Right? Hey, if a guy is going to work out in your system and you know how you're going to use him and he, it looks like he's going to be open and receptive to being used that way, yeah, I'm open to trading up. It's all about production. You think he's going to produce? Does he seem like he's going to fit with the team really well and like be part of the team culture and all that and just produce his ass off? Yeah, go get him. Trade up. Thank <laughs> you.